I'd like to read from Isaiah chapter 40. So if you can make the switch, those of you who have already turned to Luke chapter 2, to Isaiah chapter 40, I'm going to read the first nine verses of that chapter uh, for our consideration this morning. It is God's word, so therefore I ask that if you can, you would stand as it is read. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the desert prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass. And all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. Because the breath of the Lord blows on them, surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of our God stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. You may be seated. Thank you. Lord, we've already been blessed in so many ways this morning. And now I pray that as we consider your word, that you would open our minds and hearts, that we might receive it as you would intend us to. May the same Holy Spirit that inspired these writings open ourselves to uh, the meaning and what it means for us. Speak, I pray, in these moments. In Christ's name, amen. Good tidings. It's not a phrase we often use. I'm going to take a guess here and say that probably none of you use that expression in regular conversation this week, that you went up to somebody and said, good tidings, or heard it back. If we hear it at all, it's usually this time of year, and it's usually because of some very familiar Bible texts that we all have heard for years. Those of us who grew up on the King James Version or may continue to use it, We see that word often in scripture and some of the most important verses that we think about during this time of year. Of course, the key one is the angel's announcement to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, where the angel says, Fear not, for behold, I bring you what? Good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. But the term good tidings is used more than that. In many of the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, we see that phrase used. And whenever the word tidings is used, it's always used with the word good or glad. For instance, Isaiah 41, 27. The first shall say to Zion, behold, behold them, and I will give to Jerusalem one that brings good tidings. Or Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bring good tidings, that publishes peace, that brings good tidings, that publishes salvation, that says unto Zion, thy God reigns. Or Isaiah 61, 1, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. And so forth. Nahum 1.15. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that brings good tidings. That publishes peace. You get the point. It's used quite often in regard to 
the event that we celebrate this time of year. And the word tidings has found its way into many of our most familiar and beloved Christmas carols. I did just a really quick search in our hymn book of the carols we have there. For instance, angels we have heard on high, what the gladsome tidings bring. Or the echo carol, glad tidings brought an angel bright. Or infant holy, infant lowly, angels singing, Noel's ringing, tidings bringing. Or while shepherds watch their flocks, glad tidings of great joy I bring. O little town of Bethlehem, the great glad tidings tell. God rest you, merry gentlemen, tidings of comfort and joy, and on and on and on. Tidings. What does that mean? Well, it means news or information or a message. And in the Messianic texts and in the carols that I just cited, it's always modified with the word good or glad. So what is the good tidings that's being referred to in the scriptures and in our hymns? Well, obviously, the good tidings in this context is the birth of the Messiah. The birth that had been prophesied for many years, it had been awaited for centuries and finally fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. These verses refer to news of what God was about to do. It was going to be good news when it happened. It was going to be a glad message when it happened. And it was. And it still is. The story of God's plan of redemption for man is good news. It's good tidings. That's really what the word gospel means. Good tidings or good news. And the inauguration of that plan was God's incarnation God coming to earth, taking upon himself human flesh, living among men so that he could die an atoning death and be raised again. The birth of Christ was the first necessary step in the execution of God's wonderful plan. I want us to consider this morning Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40 is one of the great chapters in all of the scriptures. I remember years ago, I was in a meeting, and the question was posed to us in that meeting, if you were stranded on the proverbial desert island, and you could only have one chapter of the scriptures, or one chapter, one Old Testament chapter, one New Testament chapter, which ones would you choose? I answered at that time, and it would still be my answer today. My Old Testament passage is Isaiah 40. It begins with a note of comfort, and it ends talking about being on eagle's wings. And in between is all the reasons why that happens. In case you're interested, my New Testament passage is Romans 8. So I knew you'd want to know that. This chapter, Isaiah chapter 40, was given to God's people at a time of great national distress. Israel really needed to hear some good tidings at this particular point. And God gives them those good tidings that messianic deliverance is coming, God is about to act. And to me, it culminates in verse 9. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Here is your God. Does that sound familiar? We've used the word, we've sung it, we've said it in this service several times already. Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? Go ahead, tell me. God with us. Isaiah says the good tidings that we are to shout from the hilltop is your God. 
see your God. Here is your God. Is that not the Christmas message? Here is your God, Emmanuel. And this is a call to proclaim and spread that news. God is here. Messiah has come. This is good tidings. What makes the arrival of Christ good tidings? There's so many ways to answer that question, but I'm just going to pick a few things out of these verses of Isaiah 40 for us to consider. Three things, specifically. First, it's good tidings because it's a hopeful message. It's hopeful. Begins, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Israel, to put it plainly, was on a losing streak. They had a rough go of it. They were judged harshly by God for their idolatry and their rebellion. And they wondered, has God abandoned us? Has God left us? Are all the glory days in the past? Will there be a reprieve? Is there a reason for hope? And God's answer through the prophet Isaiah here is, Yes, there is reason for hope. Comfort my people. I'm about to bring deliverance. Folks, that message is for us as well. We live in a world, as Isaiah did, that is dominated by sin, pain, sorrow, injustice, inhumanity, dissension, And we all know that ultimately the culprit in all of this is our sin. Our sin and guilt and judgment and condemnation. God is holy and we're not. We're guilty. And God must punish as a righteous God and we have no escape. But the good news is that God himself makes a way out. He promises a deliverance from this hopeless state. God is the only one who can make a way out of this dilemma. And he did. And he does. Through Jesus Christ. You notice those, the verse here, your sin has been paid for. Direct allusion to Jesus' atoning death on the cross. He says your hard service, your punishment, your judgment is in the past. It's finished. Remember somebody who said it is finished? Jesus did on the cross. For the people in Isaiah's time, this was all going to be in the future, but for you and I, the event that precipitated this has already happened. We're on the other side of it. We can understand it. We can embrace it. And we experience all of the result of that in part now, but in complete fullness someday. God's message is a hopeful message. We live in a world that needs to be shown that there is hope, and we know what it is. So why don't we shout it from the mountaintop? Second thing that makes it good tidings. We're told it's a glorious message. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The God who is unseen, invisible, spirit, will be made manifest in the world. And this experience will not be just for a privileged few. 
but all will see him. The New Testament counterpart to that, of course, is in the first chapter of John. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Glory is an attribute of God. It's something seen when one sees God. You might say that glory is God's identifying feature. Hard to explain, to put into words what glory is. But recognized when it's seen. And in Jesus, we see God's glory. God is revealed. It's what makes Jesus unique among all of the people ever born. Because he was a baby, yes. But he was in the truest sense of the word, a glorious baby. Because he bore the identifying image of God, because he was God. It's a glorious message. A baby was born. But of course, the bigger message is that God has come to earth. God's message to us is a glorious message. And it is worth telling because our world needs to know that. It is worth shouting from the mountaintops good tidings. And then finally, it's a sure message. Verse 6, a voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass and all the glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of our God stands forever. There are many messages out there. Lots of people want to tell us what to think. What to believe. All sorts of man-made philosophies. Religious and non-religious This time of the year, all sorts of voices trying to tell us what the Christmas spirit is. And there doesn't seem to be any consensus. What is the Christmas spirit? The only message that rings true is the one that comes, as we read here, from the mouth of the Lord. It is a sure message, one that is trustworthy, true, secure, one that endures forever, one that will never change. Based upon God's word, the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The message of God, the tidings of God, if you will, will never be changed. They'll never be superseded by another. It truly is what it is and ever will be. And nothing can or will ever diminish or destroy the veracity of the good tidings. The one thing we can be absolutely sure of in a world that is constantly changing is the word of our God stands forever. Amen? Amen. And so good tidings based upon that word will stand forever. God's message to us is a sure message. That's good tidings and deserves to be shouted from the rooftops. I read for you again verse 9. You who bring good tidings to Auburn, put your locality wherever it is you live, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Auburn, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Maine, here is your God. Good tidings. It may not be universally accepted. It wasn't in Isaiah's day. It wasn't even in Jesus' day. But be assured, we should be shouting the good tidings from the rooftops. Tidings that are hopeful, 
that are glorious, that are sure, and what the world needs to know. Author Marva Dawn said this, We are called to be heralds. We are called to report faithfully those good tidings that are ours to give. Behold your God. All we do is tell others that the Lord is here. The rest is up to God. That's our good tidings. I close with this. This week I read an article that was talking about Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and his poem, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Mentioned that he wrote that during the Civil War. Our country was in really bad shape. He himself had experienced personal tragedy as his wife had died in a fire. He himself getting burned trying to save her, but to no avail. He didn't want any of his children to go into battle, but one of them did and he got severely injured in battle. Longfellow was despairing about the state of his life, state of the life of the nation that he loved. And it's reflected in the words of that hymn where he says, there is no peace on earth for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But then it changes. Longfellow finds a reason for hope a reason to go forward, then peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong will fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill toward men. It would seem to me that we live today in similar times as Longfellow. What will sustain us? What will give us hope? Where will we see glory? What can we count on? Is it not what Isaiah said so many years ago? Say to the people, say, here, here is your God. Let's pray. Forgive us, Lord, if we're hesitant to shout that news from the rooftops or whatever form that we're able to communicate it. Remind us, Lord, that this is good tidings. It's been good tidings since it was prophesied and on the night that it happened. And it's good tidings ever since and will continue to be. So Lord, help us to always live out and share and first of all, embrace ourselves. The good tidings. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.